Mike Sharman's Victorian Railway was very well known on the exhibition trail until he built it into his loft some years back. All the models on the layout are to EM gauge clearances, including the broad gauge, although the latter is to the correct 28 mm gauge. Here we see a standard gauge Crampton, London, crossing the broad gauge main line. Mike takes up the story. This London North Western gantry is at the entrance to Bogsworth Junction, and the two trains entering are flirt of the Chatham and Dover Railway, which is backing onto its train, and the London and North Western Railway, Liverpool, which um, was built by Barry Curtis and Kennedy again in 1840s. Flirt here is a jack shaft Crampton, which means that it's got just two wheels driven by a crank. Coming off the other end of the train is London Chatham and Dover Railway Spay, which is an 042 tank. She's moved down onto the sector plate, which was quite a commonly used piece of railway machinery in the early days because it saved, in, in this instance, it saved something like the length of three sets of points. Um, they were sometimes hand-worked and sometimes had a donkey engine working them and were in varied places. For instance, there was one at Ventnor in the Isle of Wight and there was one in one of the big Birmingham stations. Liverpool's just arrived on an incoming train has been uncoupled and we move up to the head shunt. Um, Liverpool is a London North Western engine and in fact most of Bogsworth is based on London North Western practice. The building coming into view now is a London North Western sectional building with the screens on the outside and these screens and panels were often made up in a factory and brought on site and assembled to whatever size you wanted the station to be. This loco is a 222 Furness well tank, just left the coaling stage. It's motored with a Case Mark II motor through a gearbox and onto the centre driving wheel, which is as it should be. It's balanced um, between the two pony wheels by a very lightly adjusted coil spring, so that if there's over energetic handling on the controls, the engine does pitch when it's either started or stopped. Here we have the railway policeman sat on top of the coaches and his job was to put the brakes on should the train break up, as it often did, and disappear in sections. The London North Western slotted post signals just gone off and in the early period they were all of this, this variety with the holes cut in them supposedly to cut down wind resistance. The larger gantry that we're passing under is the same pattern and you can see it's designed exactly for Bogsworth's platform layout. The model of Liverpool, who's backing down from the head shunt now, is something like 20 years old and is one of, another example of the free bogey system in the tender, whereby the front four wheels are cosmetic and the tender is resting on the foot plate of the locomotive. This gives you a lot more traction because the Crampton relies purely on that single wheel to haul the train along. The large sheaves on the driving wheels are two foot nine diameter and had to be lubricated over the side of an oil can quite frequently to prevent trouble. Flirt leaves now with its train, um, passing the southeastern Crampton, the old number 92, built by Stevenson's. Flirt has a, a gain of K's Mark II motor and is geared through 40 to 1 gearing with the free bogey tender and with the length of the locomotive and the weight in the boiler and the weight in the tender is a very powerful engine indeed. The train it's pulling you'll notice they're very short vehicles and they look rather like three stagecoaches joined together which in fact was what the design was based on. Flirt's arriving in the mixed gauge workshops station, which was the first part of the layout to be built as a backdrop 
to all the collection of Victorian locomotives, along with a lot of the Victoriana that went with it, um, large cast iron water crons, which in some cases weigh well over a tonne. This shot shows the eight foot six wheeled Cornwall in its original form as built in 1847, with the boiler down between the frames. The rebuilt version of the original now exists in the York Rower Museum. Flirts leaving its train up into the head shunt, passing the steam navvy, which is digging out the broad gauge extension into the next section of the layout. These steam navvies um, were worked by a big vertical boiler donkey engine and this one, as you can see, is just passing Isambard, studying the plans. This is number 10, one of the earliest models in the collection of an early Hackworth engine, an 060, with two tenders. The wheels are cast in two pieces, and to keep them together, they've got wooden plugs hammered into recesses, and then the whole thing was trued up on the track afterwards. The following train is of children wagons and small short wheelbase um, coal wagons which were hauled by horses round the quarries into position and then coupled up to the main train. This side of the main line we have the main power source for the workshops which is a large flywheel beam engine with a low pressure single cylinder. The coal being delivered by the narrow gauge feeder line with a little works locomotive which is passing the machines on the inside, this one being a milling machine, all driven by belts from overhead. The lathe on the far side, driven from extensions from the other pulleys. Here we have the erecting shop with several of the bits of locomotives laying about. And this shed is connected to the number one shed by the traverser. And in the number one shed, we've got the forge, with a bellows operated um, by a chain. We've got a paint shop in the background with people rubbing down and painting. And we've got the works fire engine on duty standing by outside. Moving out onto the Traversa is the Kitson 7-foot Midland Railway Crampton with, um, again, a K's motor. The Traverser itself is operated by another motor under the deck through quite low gearing and all the solenoids and contacts are easily accessible because the deck can be picked out and serviced upside down as are the turntables on the rest of the layout. This is one of two of this pattern of Crampton, number 130 and 131, and none of them lasted more than a few years because the track and loading conditions in Britain resulted in very big and heavy trains, and with a single driving wheel, the Cramptons just weren't equipped to cope. One of the most successful passenger classes on the Great Western Broadgates was the Firefly class. There were some 60 of these built by nine different builders, and it's coming into a model of one of the stations of the period, which had an up and a down station rather than a station either side of the tracks. This meant that the up and the down line crossed in a centre complex and the trains were serviced from the middle, often by horse shunting. While the trains were being made up in the platforms, there is a passing line which can be used both up and down. And we see here Titios, which is an 060 goods, um, going at the moment past the down station. It's an outside framed locomotive and with the usual mixed variety of broad gauge stock. Broad gauge signals were based around two main types, a disc and bar 
and a fantail or a board shaped signal. The permutations were that when the bar was showing with the arrow of the fantail pointing to the track it was dead stop. The arrow pointing away from the track with the disc was clear ahead and the arrow pointing to the track again with the disc was a caution. The double junction shown here is in fact just a double disc and bar. The bars had several attachments to them, this one being a level crossing signal showing the bar top and bottom. Vulcan is one of the very early batch of large wheeled locomotives, none of which were awfully successful. This one was rebuilt into a tank engine and a nice photograph of it exists on a turntable dated 1858. The model has a tender drive, which I don't normally like, but it did allow me to put the full crankshaft in between the wheels and allow the valve gear and piston rods to be seen in motion. On this type of station layout, the goods yard in fact formed another through route and complete trains came into the yard and went across the turntable. This was a particular Great Western feature and there are photographs about of some of the Welsh lines in Standergaze days with the turntable clearly shown in the entrance to the yard. The turntable serves both the goods yard and the mixed gauge loco shed. Firefly is seen on shed by the Great Western water crane, the pattern of which didn't change right up to the end of steam. Falcon moves off across the turntable to pause by the timber coaling stage with the early pattern cranes made from rail and ballast um, on the deck. In the foreground, we have the Firefly Electra leaving the up station with three of the very typical squat, broad coaches of the period. They're first class coaches, and the lamps on the top had to be shared between two compartments. Electra passes on to a standard Brunel timber viaduct, of which there were very many stretching down into the West Country. Back at the up station, we see the entrance to the main station building where the first class passengers were accommodated inside and the second and third kept out in the rain. This shows the turntable in the centre complex, which allows the horses to shunt vehicles onto the rear of both the up and the down trains. Coming down the bank towards the dock station is the London Chatham Dover Spay, which is an 042 tank built by Nielsen's in Scotland. She has a pivoted pair of drivers which allow it to clear over the bumps, and the rear pony truck is sprung centralised to guide the entire locomotive into the track work. The harbour station is the other end of the workshop's layout, forming two sides of an L. The signal cabin here is one of the type built on stilts used on the southwestern with rotary signals. The inlet from the sea shows a small trading sailing ship with all the equipment on the quayside that goes with loading, unloading, coal, cattle and the 101 things were carried in that period. Albion is a rather 
unique locomotive of which only one was built and yet it lasted some 15 years before it was sold into private ownership. It's got transverse cylinders and these operate cranks which in turn operate the wheels. It was used on the South Yorkshire Railway and for some reason was never copied and yet must have been reasonably successful. Such an interesting prototype called out to be built and this one, due to the complications of the mechanism, means that both axles, in fact, are driven by two bevel gears, which makes it rather noisy. The bevels are then driven from either end of a case motor again with um, worm wheels which were turned up on the lathe. She's backing down onto a very early rake of card-built coaches. These were cut laboriously from postcard and close examination shows the slight bowing around the windows that ageing has brought about. The sailing ship was built from an airfix kit of the Discovery, which was the wrong scale. So by leaving the deck housings off and putting four millimetre scale wheel and lifeboat fittings, it brought the boat within a usable scale. Part of the narrow gauge network takes us down the line and across the river to the base of the incline, which was used for hauling wagons up and down to the slate quarries, which were laid out on various levels on the side of the hill. They were operated by a big drum in the roof of the building and this drum simply unwound one cable as the wagon went down, winding the other one up. Quite often, the weight of the full wagon would be used against the brake to pull the empty wagon up on the opposite track. Most parts of the layout and the stock were built over 20 years ago. Mike's interests remain with pre-1870 prototypes, but he is now building to Proto 4 standards for 4mm models. The latest model is this Great Northern Starrock Goods, in its original form with a powered tender. The class was very successful, but only lasted in this form for a few years, as the footplate crews demanded extra wages for running two engines. Starrock refused any increase, and the crews refused to work them, so the tender power units were removed. In any event, the locomotives were too powerful for their day, and it's difficult to believe that the boilers were up to supplying steam to both power units for long periods. The model uses Mike's own wheels, and is completely scratch-built, except for the two motors, which are the trusty old K's Mark II's. In our